Welcome in to Rounding the Bases, live presented by Enterprise Bank and Trust, episode number 101. Hope everyone had a great weekend. Happy Monday. And a little bit of a new backdrop here. I didn't switch locations, but I had finally decided that I uh, wanted to mess with the, some things in here a little bit. My friends over at Kansas City Audiovisual had already set me up with with the, the lights and the cameras. Actually, we upgraded cameras, so a uh, new look over the weekend. Thank you, KCAV and uh, put up a, a big blue backdrop from work, um, which, which kind of, you know, works for the Royals thing and a little bit more consistent. So I uh, figure not a bad thing to have the uh, KC, or at least a piece of the KC, over my shoulder here for Rounding the Bases Live. Uh, again, if you're watching, if you're uh, running an office, if you're in an office and you have any type of audiovisual needs, uh, much bigger than anything I'm doing here, KCAV, Kansas City Audio Visual, can hook you up. And as always, a big thanks to Enterprise Bank and Trust. Hashtag no stopping you for their continued support. My guest today, there's actually a lot to talk about because um, it is sports related. But to me, um, so much of what fascinates me in and out of sports is change. Because I think we so often can be caught in saying, oh, but, but that's not the way we've done it before. See it the way, actually... Uh, baseball is evolving in some ways, in other ways still really slowly. Uh, but but nothing is the same today that it was, uh, you know, well, shoot, nothing's the same uh, as it was five months ago because of this pandemic. Uh, but it has, you know, had so many of us working from home. It has made so many aspects of our lives easier in terms of just pushing a button um, to order food, to order uh, clothes, whatever it is online, e-commerce. And it also has made entertainment in some ways easier than others. Um, so I wanted to bring in my guest today, Ben Heisler, is a guy that I've known from uh, my world of sports for a long time. But he made a pivot, and it wasn't that long ago that, that Ben and I were out for coffee talking about next steps, and then he took a next step. I had nothing to do with it. Suddenly I look up, and it's like, Ben Heisler is working for Sports Illustrated. How <laughs> cool is that? I know it's not quite that simple, but Benny, how are you? I'm good, Joel. I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and and I do appreciate that opportunity we had to talk. Um, you know, since I came to Kansas City, you've been super gracious with your time, and I've enjoyed getting to know you these last several years. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, well, we have, and so for for people that are watching right now, um, maybe at at certain points, um, and, and still sometimes now, I guess um, you, you heard Ben Heisler on Six Ten Sports, and then uh, and then you you left. You went into what looked like a really promising endeavor, and then that opportunity closed uh, its doors, and, and, and that's when you and I met. And, and now here you are, uh, writing, working, uh, doing all types of fantasy and gambling material for um, Sports Illustrated every day. I want to get into that because the world's changed. This isn't like, hey, call up Uncle Louie and, and place a bet here, I hope. I mean, I'm sure that's still out there, too. But, <laughs> but we are going towards a different direction with sports. Uh, well beyond just, you know, your family fantasy league too. Right. So first and foremost, tell me about how you ended up at Sports Illustrated. I mean, this was not a, hey, I think I'll try fantasy sports. You had really started to carve out a niche there. But I don't know, certainly when I had met with you, I don't know that you ever thought that you would land at this iconic uh, company of, of Sports Illustrated. Yeah, zero chance. I don't know if I necessarily say zero chance, Jill, because you never know uh, in this business who's watching your content, who connects with your content, um, and, and who finds something substantial. And you know, in the several months that I was looking for a new opportunity after uh, fantasy sports markets, after we lost our funding, it was a, a daily fantasy startup, uh, and that opportunity ended up closing for me uh, right towards the end of 2019. So this was even before, you know, months before the pandemic even got started. Um, you know, it's sort of the power of the side hustle, right? The opportunity to continue to connect with an audience, uh, even if you're not necessarily being backed by, you know, a full-time media company. Um, I decided right before the NFL draft that I wanted to get some of the best minds in fantasy sports and in sports gambling all together. More people were talking on Zoom. Um, I connected with a, a company called 8x8, which actually I believe does um, a video conferencing for the Kansas City Royals. And I thought, okay, how can we bring all these really smart minds together, have some fun. There's plenty of these mock NFL drafts. 
Um, but how do we do it where it's a little bit different than most? And, and how do we find a really compelling way to connect with people? And so we got all these different fantasy minds and sports gambling minds together. We all had the 30 shot or the 32 shot of everybody together. We were going one by one rapid fire making picks. And then at the end, we were celebrating a lot of the frontline workers. After someone made a pick, they took a shot. Um, and it ended up really getting a lot of traction to the point where um, I got a call about a week or so later from the people that were in charge at uh, Sports Illustrated Fantasy and Gambling. They were looking for somebody that could be versatile, that could write, that could edit, that could uh, host videos, that could be an analyst for a lot of their content. And they thought based on you know all the different clips we were putting out and the way that we were connecting with our audience, uh, they felt that it really you know worked for them. And so that was what got the conversation rolling. You know, I had done some a handful of other you know different freelance gigs over the course of, of me being unemployed, Joel, but um, you never know who's watching. And that was sort of one of those moments where they saw something that they liked and they felt that I could connect with their audience. And I've been there for about two and a half months now. I think there's a great message here because whether you are employed or not unemployed, there are still always ways to get noticed and it's not knocking on doors. I, and I mean, let me back up. Knocking on doors is important. Making connections is important, but just simply throwing out a resume or updating LinkedIn isn't always going to be enough. But if that, those LinkedIn updates or wherever you're putting your stuff, if it involves content, then there's the chance that someone's going to consume it. And so you do, you never know when that happened. But, you know, you were, I think, and I, I don't know that you and I ever talked about this. I mean, you and I grew up in the same area, well, well, well apart in terms of age. So that's how we didn't know each other. But Not that far apart, Joel. Come on now. All right. But you know, you were you you were probably entering, you know, middle school or something like that when I was graduating high school. Right, but we fair enough. grew up on the North Shore of Chicago. And yeah. so there's certainly a lot of similar backgrounds and interests and and probably some mutual acquaintances along the way too. Um, but I'm I'm guessing that the dream I don't even know this, it, the dream growing up or at least as you were getting, you know, high school college was was to be in sports or radio or something like that. Is that uh, is that true or when did that become true? Yeah, the, the radio bug bit me really early on. Um, it started when I was probably about nine, 10 years old. And I remember my mom, uh, who was a career consultant, said she still is. She's has two crazy different unique jobs, Joel. She's, a, she's been a career consultant for over 30 plus years for lawyers who are miserable with their jobs uh, in law and are looking to try and connect to something else that they resonate with. Maybe they got into law because they thought they you know, could make a lot of, a lot of money and, and do well, um, but they always wanted to be a chef or they always wanted to you know, be on uh, the Golf Channel or you know, start their own podcast or whatever it might be. And they went a different way. You know, my mom went into law, hated it, went into marketing, hated it, and then decided this is you know a new opportunity. And she kind of connects with that because her side hustle uh, is a mixologist in Chicago. She designs signature cocktails for uh, different corporate events and weddings and so on and so forth. But she used to do a radio spot on WBBM, which was the the top news channel uh, in Chicago. And I remember like getting a chance to go into WBBM and meet a guy by the name of, of Josh Liss, who's been you know, the longtime sports director there and see how everything was put together and the audio equipment and the big microphone. And um, that, that got me hooked. And then uh, I went to Nutra High School in Winnetka, Illinois, and they had a high school radio station. So I was doing play by play. I was hosting my own talk show. It allowed me to figure out how to book guests that had no business coming on a high school radio show. But, you know, several of my, my favorite people, you know, Dan Bernstein of 670 The Score in Chicago. We got uh, Dick Vitale of ESPN for uh, a charity radiothon we were doing. So from, from that moment, I was really hooked and went to school at Indiana to do the same thing. I, I thought my career goal, Joel, was to either go into play-by-play. -play. I did that for two summers over the course of college, uh, independently, minor league play-by-play. Um, and ultimately, I, I left that because I just didn't like how I sounded as far as a baseball play-by-play -play broadcaster. I thought, nah, there's nobody needs to hear Mickey Mouse on helium calling a home run. So I, I shifted in another direction uh, to go on the sports talk side because I love the opportunity to build an audience and, and, and really talk directly to listeners. And so I went down that route for, for several years. Um, and even when I came to Kansas City, the goal was to get on air. Um, I loved being the executive producer of The Drive uh, with Danny Parkins and Carrington Harrison. We had some great years, um, and, and I love that show, and I, I love both those guys. But my goal was to get on air, and I was able to do that through the fantasy route and build my audience that way. So when I left radio, it was kind of twofold for me because I thought to myself, 
you know, I'm leaving an industry full time that I've always wanted to be a part of since I was a kid. Um, but I also knew I'd still have that connection back to radio with this new job of running this daily fantasy site by being able to be a fantasy uh, football analyst, by being a part of these different shows and TV broadcasts, you know, doing some stuff with the KCTV five locker room show and, and just being able to still connect doing my own content. Um, so that was sort of what kept me involved on that side, knowing that it wasn't going to completely go away for good. I was still going to be able to really have that connection there. Um, but yeah, from, from the moment I was a kid, I, I wanted to be on the radio in some capacity. And, um, you know, it's not necessarily the exact way I'm doing it now, but to be able to call into some shows that I love being a part of and talk fantasy and gambling with them, that's, that's a lot of fun. Well, I, you know, it's it's fascinating to me because, and, and my story's not the same at all, but where I can relate to it was that I only had one dream, and that dream was to be on TV. If there was something specific I wanted to do with it, and this is the same thing, I mean, this is, this is through even elementary school, certainly middle school and high school, I wanted to either be the, the guy on the, the news... Um, doing the sports, you know, the sports anchor. So for you and I growing up, like, you know, for people in Kansas City, uh, maybe they grew up with, a, you know, with a Frank Bull or a, an Al Wallace or, um, you know, one of those guys. For us, I think in Chicago, you grew up with Mark Gene Greco. Right. And, uh, and that was, he, and he's still there to this day. And as a matter of fact, I bumped into him at the Final Four. Illinois was playing in the Final Four in St. Louis in 2005. 2005 yeah it was right after that insane win over uh, over Arizona where they came back from yes. I think 14 points down with about three minutes to go and and they were playing and so Gene Greco and I were in a scrum and while my hair wasn't as white as it is now it was you know it was well on its way and I remember <laughs> saying to him hey um you came and spoke to my high school when I was a kid and you know, you were you were my idol growing up, and he was just like, oh, because I, I don't. <laughs> I'm not saying he dyes his hair or anything like that, but you know, he he's probably got to be in his later 60s at this point, or even at that point, he was in his later 50s, and and he still looks like he's you know 28 or 30. So, <laughs> um, so he was a little bit embarrassed by that, but but that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to either do that growing up, or I wanted to be the play-by-play -play guy, and neither of those happened, and I. I had steps along the way to get closer to his type of role, but never could really crack that. It was always, you know, the third, kind of the third guy, and, and then occasionally it'd be the fill-in guy. I don't know if that, that does. I know that sounds familiar. Like, you know, as, as, as someone that wanted to be a radio host, um, you would fill in, and you were doing the updates, and you were booking the show. So you were as important as any role there, but it wasn't quite what you were looking for. I know I'm speaking for you, but I, I, I get it, and I understand it. And so, like, for me, if you told me when I was growing up uh, that I would host pre- and post-game shows and travel with the baseball team and all that, I'd say, well, how does a pre- and post-game show even work? Like, what is that? Right? And so, But but yet, here I am living my dream and zero complaints at all. Right. And so I think for you, like, you couldn't have ever envisioned, first off, if someone told you that you were going to write for Sports Illustrated as a kid, you would have been like, holy crap. Oh, uh, that's amazing. And then if they said you're going to write about fantasy sports and gambling, you would have been like, huh? Right. So I, it's got to be pretty amazing just to see the way this all developed because it wasn't part of the plan. No, you're, you're, you're entirely right. And it's funny to think. I, I remember actually the first time that I even learned about fantasy sports was through SI for Kids. I remember their, their online site. And God, I'm trying to remember how old I was. Maybe it was like... 11, 12 years old. So I was still probably using dial up at that point and going through AOL. Uh, my, my first screen name, by the way, this is how cool I was, uh, Joel. Jazz Dude 21. The 21 was for Sammy Sosa. Um, that was one of many different screen names that eventually would not go on the stick, but we've still been able to make it in this industry at this point. Um, but I remember they actually had sort of a salary cap fantasy baseball league. And you could choose the different players and each player was like, I think maybe like $10 or $100 or whatever it was. And you had to fill out your team. It was sort of the first time that I'd ever seen anything like this. And now, you know, the ironic part is you know, that's the, the big industry of daily fantasy sports right now is you know, DraftKings. You have $50,000 and every player has a monetary value and you have to figure out ways to stay under the cap. And I remember thinking like, this is kind of cool. You can fill out your team for like a month 
And then you get to go over and do it again. And then I had more interest in, in playing in other fantasy leagues with friends. And uh, I've been in a league now for about 10, 11 years with uh, a good friend of mine from the North Shore and, and some of his college friends and a few others that I've brought in along the way. But it never in my wildest dreams at that point in my life did I think this could be a full-time industry. I knew that people could go to Las Vegas and bet. And, you know, I made my, my maiden voyage to Vegas when I was 21 and, and spent some time in the sports book, you know, but it was more sort of a casual opportunity. I had no point in my, in, in those first, I don't know, 30 years of my life. I'm 32 now. Did I really think this was going to be my full time career? And I'm, I'm so thankful that there is an audience for it, that there is a growing audience for it, especially on the sports gambling side, Joel. Like, you know, for a lot of the listeners and, and viewers that are in Kansas and Missouri, it's not legal in those states yet, but it's going to happen. You're starting to see more states really jump on board because they understand the value that's associated and the amount of money that can come in. And especially with more people being able to just go and, and bet on their phones with a lot of these online sports books. You have DraftKings, you have BetMGM, you have Bet Rivers, which has become uh, a huge part of the market share in Chicago, FanDuel. Um, you know, there's several more that I'm probably forgetting to name. It, it's going to become very accessible in, in all 50 states very soon. And so I, I think what's been great is that the more that the market demands more opportunity for content for it, it, it becomes less taboo. People know that there's going to be everyday content, whether it be on Sports Illustrated, on a lot of the national shows. Uh, you know, Fox Sports One has a national betting show, ESPN. Um, it's not just like you said, you know, call up your Uncle Louie and uh, place a bet. Uh, this is happening. It's a multi billion dollar industry. Uh, so I love that I get to be a part of it and, and find ways to sort of connect the two, because I, I think a lot of people may not necessarily know how how sports gambling and fantasy works, but the two of them go really hand in hand. I don't fill out a daily fantasy lineup before checking out the over-unders for the games, before looking at the team totals, before understanding uh, where each team has moved from their original um, projections and where the initial odds come out. Um, if you look at the two of them together, you can really try and find an opportunity for a bit of an yeah, I think I'm going to basically this year. So I used to be the most dedicated fantasy football player of all time. And I know everybody says that, but I mean, I was doing it back when, you know, you had to decide if Brett Favre was going to be the top pick or you probably wanted a running back. But like, you know, we're talking about mid 90s or yeah, yeah. Man, actually. Yeah, Favre or Elway, right? Yeah. I mean, it, you know, and. And then I was quickly running those leagues, and there there were no services. There 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 was nothing. And so, I mean, my wife to this day makes fun of me, and I think we were engaged at that point, living in St. Louis. And on a Sunday night, I would get online. You could get online, but there was no service, and I would tabulate all of the scores. I would look up the box scores, or you'd wait for Monday morning in the papers, and you'd by hand you'd calculate all the scores and then all that would be left over would be the Monday night game, the one Monday night game. And then you'd do that. And Tuesday morning, I'd send out an email saying what the scores were and who the winners were and list the touchdowns and all that type of stuff. I remember even saying to a friend at one point, we should start some kind of like a service or a website <laughs> before anything happened. Uh, I, I don't know that it would have worked. Somebody was already onto that, but now it's like, you know, this, you want to pull out the phone and check an app. The scores are there. Right, right back. It's such a part of, and and I for anyone watching right now, I just want to say, like, and you don't have to necessarily be a sports fan to appreciate just the way change happens because it's everywhere now. And from a baseball standpoint, one of the most exciting days of the year is when the the baseball team has their fantasy football draft. Not every guy is in it, but I mean, it's they'll. They'll book a restaurant on the road or a conference room in a hotel and they'll cater it. I mean, it's like, it's a huge deal. And so I I think it's a huge part of sports going forward, not in the way of watching the games, but integrating it in there. You talk about it becoming legal at some point in 50 states. I think, and you tell me you know much more than I do. Um, and again, if you're looking for the way things were in the past, that's not the way the world works. I think that there will come a point where we walk into a stadium uh -huh. And there are kiosks to place bets on what's going on at that stadium that night, which sounds more like the racetrack to me. Uh, am I right? Is that where we're going? 
You're, you're already seeing it. Um, recently, actually, SI was able to get an exclusive story with PointsBet, who's based out in Denver, Colorado. And PointsBet, you know, that was one of the, the sites that I failed to mention before, but PointsBet uh, and Kroenke Sports and Entertainment, um, which owns the Denver Nuggets, Colorado Avalanche, Colorado Mammoth, which of the, uh, the National Lacrosse League, and the Pepsi Center, where all these teams play. And they also own Altitude Sports Television and Sports Talk Radio in Denver. They signed an exclusive agreement last week making PointsBet Sports and Entertainment the official gaming partner of all these different teams. So that's exactly what you're going to see. You know, They're going to have uh, stadium signage. They're going to have uh, a lounge area uh, within the stadium. And yes, there's absolutely going to be kiosks available for people to live bet sports uh, or even place a wager before the games even begin. Um, it's happening and it's happening very quickly. And this has been a model, Joel, in Europe for a long time. Um, and yeah, I guess it's sort of the racetrack model as well. But um, this is the road that teams are going to. And it's part of why so many of these different leagues were trying to get that that bit of a tax, sort of the entertainment tax, so that they could see some of the revenue coming in and why the NBA has paired up with BetMGM and why Major League Baseball has found uh, a new betting partner. Uh, ESPN and Caesars have teamed up. There, there's reasons for this, and it's because they want the experience of people to be able to keep the games going, not just on the field or in the arena. People want to be able to make bets from their phone. I, I'm thinking about an opportunity maybe one day down the road at Kauffman Stadium where you know Josh Stamon is, is out and he's facing Miguel Sano, and you know I might want to make a, a bet that it's over under 98 miles per hour. Like that's the ways. That's a way to connect with the young audience too. And I think baseball has so many opportunities through the sports betting market that they're just not even seen yet because it's not necessarily there. It's going to happen. And the more that I think these leagues embrace legal betting in the United States, uh, that's going to be a game changer for them. I think about a couple things here and I, you know, I don't know that, I don't know if I would make those type of bets or be involved. It seems like a lot of fun. I, I don't I can't envision myself doing it. It wouldn't be a conflict of interest for me with work. I mean, I'm not going to go on the air and be like, "Well, I bet on a 98 mile an hour pitch night like my business." But um, I I I personally tend to get too wrapped up in work where I would be I feel like I'd be distracted. But if I were going to a Chiefs game as a fan in a heartbeat, you know, it would just oh, be yeah. like with 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 my buddies and like, "Hey, let's let you know it's." But I think that when people say, "Well," I'll give you this example. Right now, the big the big one with baseball is people complaining about the uh, extra innings rule, putting a runner on first base. And I'm old school. I really am. Like I, I wish everything could be the way it was when I was growing up. Nothing's the way it was when I was growing up. Nothing's the way it was five months ago, obviously. The world changes. The players that are coming into these leagues right now are completely different than right. the players that were coming in when I got here in 2008 they're a different generation and the people that are watching them of their age are a different generation. I remember sitting on a plane, one of my first years here uh, on a Royals charter and my producer, I, I was kind of the, the, the one guy on the crew that was really heavily involved in Twitter. And so I was, you know, probably pitching some content. What if we got fans involved with this? And he goes, no one's going to sit at home and be on Twitter and watch a game. <laughs> They're not doing two things at once. Now, obviously, that all sounds silly at the point, but I was like, yeah, maybe. I don't know. I, like, And now, like, it didn't sound so crazy what he was saying to me at that point, but I was trying to fight for some different type of content. Right. And I think we all know now that that the up-and-coming generation does 25 things at once. It doesn't matter whether you like it or not. They do it because that's the Pandora's box that we've opened. Correct. So, you know, you, you touched on something here. Like you can't stay the same. The, the the game that the younger generation, the kids that are coming up, your young kid who still has a long ways to go, uh, we don't even know what that'll look like. But people that younger, they're 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 in search of something more than just the game. You're right. And I think that's sort of the value that daily fantasy started to provide. And again, I, I think season long fantasy was a big part of that, especially in baseball and in football for a long time. It was another way to sort of have action within the action, if you will. Uh, but now imagine being able to do that and create a whole different team every day. 
You know, you know, Major League Baseball, you can play a hundred and well, I mean, not this year. You can play 60 or I guess you're in, you're in St. Louis, maybe you know, 15 or 20. Uh, you can play every day that there's action going on and you can look at matchups and you can say, OK, um, let, let's go ahead and look at Kansas City versus Chicago. I know Kyle Hendricks is pitching at Wrigley Field. He's been dominant at home uh, where his splits are outstanding. He's got like a two ERA at home and a five ERA on the road. Uh, Kansas City has been striking out a little bit more than often. So even though he doesn't project to have more than his over under of four and a half strikeouts, maybe this is the matchup that sets it up. So you're diving into a something that maybe most people would look outside of. And there's plenty of people too, Joel, and you know this, that just want to enjoy the game, that just enjoy the back and forth and the conversation that goes with that. But um, I, I think at some point the the coverage will change a little bit. You might have a bottom line where, I mean, you're seeing it now with a lot of the StatCast broadcasts, right? Um, you know, where the different hitting charts are going to, um, you know, what happens with winning percentage at this point in the game, um, you know, his swing and miss percentage. You know, there's more numbers that are coming out. And I think for some viewers, they might say, well, this feels a little bit overwhelming to me. But a lot more viewers love being informed and they know that it's not necessarily being jammed down their throat. It's just another part of the broadcast. So I think if you're opening up Pandora's box, find another way to, to continue to get people to embrace what's coming. We're in the information age where it's never been easier to get that. You know, maybe that means more tailored broadcasts that are involved in, in the fantasy and gambling side. Maybe there's a more numbers oriented broadcast and you have multiple channels. You know, Thursday night football, I think there's like eight different broadcasts now um, because of Amazon Prime. You have the, the British broadcast, which I, I enjoy getting a kick out of. <laughs> um, you have Hannah Storm and Andrea Kramer for a different perspective. The regular one with Joe Buck and Troy Aikman. Um, I, I don't think necessarily more is a bad thing as long as people find a way to connect to it all right a few things um before we wrap up one you know i remember in the old days you could tune in say on a you know saturday morning radio and it was like at least in my mind it was like Vinny from new jersey or vegas with the free the free two picks. All you have to do is call this 800 or 900 number. Yeah. And, and so, you know, you, you try it once, right. And you call it and it's like, yep, I, I've got a little something here for you. And if you just sign up for this, you know, it was one of those. And, and he knew like every little tiny detail, but you, you, you didn't get any sense that it was really all that informed. It was just like, you know, Vinny sitting in his wife beater at home. I don't know. And that's not what this is nowadays. There's so much research. There's so much information. I I gave up <clears throat> for a while, and I've always done fantasy baseball with friends. Um, I don't talk about that on the air. It's not that I can't. I'm not a Royals employee. I think that if you were an employee of a baseball team, you couldn't. Right. Um, but I've done stuff with friends for, you know, 20 years. I mean, dating back to before I got to Kansas City. Um but the joke was always like, oh, well, you know more than everybody else. And I'm like, how can I know more than anybody else when whatever I know pops up on every single freaking website in the right. world? There's nothing secret anymore because of the amount of information. Right. So I don't have any advantage. If anything, I have a disadvantage because I like to pull for the guys who I like. I like to pull for the good guys. It's more emotional for me. I, I prefer to root for good people versus you know the bad dudes out there fortunately the royals don't have a lot of bad dudes but i get it it becomes personal to me what's an everyday like for you in terms of the amount of research i know you're not waking up and picking stuff out of the hat that's not who you are so tell me and everyone the amount of work that goes in to eventually making those picks or making those suggestions or writing what you do yeah, I, I think there's times, though, by the way, Joel, where, you know, if I haven't been necessarily hitting on a lot of picks, I'm, the hat starts to feel a little bit more appealing to me. And I'm thinking, OK, maybe, maybe this is the week that we that we go for the hat. Um, you know, as far like I'll, I'll give you an example. We had the, the PGA championship over the weekend and golf betting and golf daily fantasy has really started to skyrocket. Um, and I knew that we didn't have a, a whole lot of coverage at SI by the time that I got there. So I really wanted to to dive in. And I thought this would be a really good opportunity for us to create a little bit more market share, connect with an audience because it was a growing industry. So, you know, initially odds will come out, you know, first thing Monday morning, maybe sometimes even Sunday night, 
Um, I, I always recommend for people to shop around. And, you know, again, it's sort of dependent on where you are, but I'll look and say, all right, so this is where BetMGM has posted their odds. And I'll look at DraftKings and I'll look at FanDuel and I'll try and put them all together collectively and say, all right, where is everybody sort of universally in agreement? Where are the discrepancies and why are there discrepancies? And then I'll start to dive into a little bit more of the research involved. PGATour.com, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's plenty of sites too. And, you know, SI is going to be going uh, to a soon subscription model for fantasy and for gambling. And you know, people can definitely check that out at SI.com slash fantasy or SI.com slash gambling. Um, there's so much information out there. And a lot, I think, a lot of, I think what sort of helps people stand out is how do you take this collection of both subscription-based information and free information you can get anywhere and just put it in a way that's really easy to digest? How can I take um, you know, for example, in Major League Baseball, you know, if you're looking at um, expected weighted on base average, which is a key stat that you're looking for as far as trying to determine, all right, who's going to be my power option for today? Who sees this pitcher really well? You can get a lot of that for free on MLB.com in the MLB StatCast pages. But I want something that's going to put that with everything else I need all on the same page. And that's going to be an appeal there. So I'll go through PGATour.com, I'll go through Fantasy National and a wide variety of other places where I know I can get really good fantasy content. I'll listen to podcasts, you know, I'll watch some videos on YouTube. Again, there's a lot of good free content and it's up to me to try and determine, okay, if this analyst says, sees Tommy Fleetwood, for example, as a 40 to one option, and that's not even close to where he should be because of his iron play really recently. You know, the only reason that Tommy Fleetwood isn't doing well is because he putted like crap last week. And so the market didn't indicate that he missed the cut because his putter was, was terrible. Now, all of a sudden you're looking at and saying, okay, Vegas has determined this odds based off of where he actually finished. The metrics are telling me that this guy is ready to break out of a slump that he's hitting the ball really well, but if he gets his putter hot for one day, you know, then you're looking in the right direction. Or you can even determine it based off course conditions. How long is the course? Whether or not this putter uh, is better on, on bent grass or poa greens. There's so much information, Joel, it's incredible. But then I'll look at all of that and say, okay, well, what's not necessarily adding up? And I'll do that for daily fantasy too. Why is this guy being overpriced? I learned this from a colleague of mine. Tiger Woods is always going to be a bad bet especially now. There's a couple of reasons for that. One, there's the emotional connection. The public loves to play Tiger Woods because it's Tiger Woods. And they're expecting that one time where he won the Masters you know, a year or so ago and uh, got everybody back on track and thought, all right, it's Tiger, it's a major. The, the realistic odds for what Tiger should have been at the PGA Championship this week was probably about 100 to 1, maybe 125 to 1, purely based on recent performance. Do you know what he was going for uh, in Vegas this week, Joel? Oh gosh, no! But I'm sure it was. I don't know about thirty-five to one. I was gonna say yeah, and purely on name, right? Yeah, it's name recognition. It's a guy that the public wants to back, and especially in golf, which is a lot of fun to bet. You're not going to win most of the time, but if you do win, then you get a nice, sizable payday because even the best golfers in the world are coming in at 12 to one or, or 14 to one odds. Um, but there's inherent value in fading Tiger Woods and going for some of the other names. Like, you know, I was fortunate enough to, to write up Colin Morikawa this week and that ended up coming through for me. It's not going to happen all the time, but uh, this is somebody that was playing really good golf that knows this course really well. Um, you know, he's elite off irons. And so, especially on an approach game um, in a tough, windy course with a lot of rough, that stands out, and I was able to get him at 33 to 1. So those are the things that you're typically looking for. It's a lot of research during the week. You're seeing where a lot of the money is coming in. And you follow that money. Um, and sometimes sort of that movement helps indicate, all right, and maybe there's some professionals that are also going on this guy too. Maybe this is an opportunity to jump on. So it, it really changes every day, Joel. I just got a uh, – I'll just throw this in there. I mean, it was just a little feedback. No relation, but another North Shore guy. Um, I had to guard Rich Goldberg in, in junior high, but he was like six foot seven. <laughs> so, um, he still is, he, he has to turn the mic up. So I told you I was messing with some audio. I need Ben over here. He used to mess with all this kind of stuff back in his radio days. <laughs> uh, I, I was tweaking some things over the weekend and, and switched out a microphone. So, but, uh, a couple of final things, 
what you said was interesting to me because I remember doing a story back when I worked in St. Louis. It was a, um, it was a professor at St. Louis University who had done some study. I think it was all about the odds in terms of the NCAA tournament. Right. And his advice was basically avoid any number one pick that it looks like everyone else is taking because if you're going to get that one, right. then you got to get everything else right. And so, yeah, it's the safe route to take but you're going to be in there with everyone else. So from that day forward, I always looked for the least attractive number one, whichever number one or maybe a number two that was getting the least amount of attention or sometimes just taking Duke because so many people hate Duke that it was like the opposite of Tiger Woods, right? So right. you're kind of trying to find not an outlier, but you're trying to find the anti-trend, so to speak. I'm really glad you brought that up because that is a big strategy in a lot of these large field daily fantasy tournaments is you're looking for ownership percentages. So, um, you know, case in point, if you're football is probably the best example for this, because I think it's it's names that people will mostly know. So let's say we're in, we're in Kansas City, right? The easy play every week is to play all the guys on the Chiefs, play Mahomes, play Tyree Hill, play Travis Kelsey. This year, probably play Clyde Edwards-Alaire because the Chiefs' offense is going to be great. Um, but if you're trying to win a million dollars against 85,000 other people, you know, based on percentage, if the matchup is good for the Chiefs, the bulk of the ownership is going to be on Kansas City. So that's why it's important to sort of look at the other line movement. So if there's another game, you know, maybe it's Miami and Baltimore, for example. All right, so Baltimore's got another really good offense. They have Lamar Jackson. That guy can score fantasy points in a hurry. Maybe people will look away from his ownership because they know the matchup for Mahomes is even better. Maybe you stack both plays in that game, even though Miami's not any good, because at some point they're going to have to score some late points just to even catch up. Baltimore might rest some of their starters. The game total is one of the highest on the board. You're looking for inherent value wherever you can. And so that's why I think it's more important. Like you said, that strategy is absolutely applicable when it comes to daily fantasy. If you're trying to win a tournament, the best plays aren't necessarily always the right plays. It's about trying to find the guys that are going to be lower owned that have a chance to go off with the rest of the public away from them. You know, sometimes you have to sort of take that lesser play, knowing that the upside could still be just as good as the guy that you know is likely going to deliver. So that's absolutely applicable even today. How often do you feel like a meteorologist? <laughs> All the time. Yeah. <laughs> for, for two reasons, actually. The first is um, <laughs> weather, weather matters. So I'm looking at a lot of the different weather across the country. There, there's a great meteorologist named Kevin Roth who writes for a company called Roto Grinders. And he goes in every day and, you know, for Major League Baseball and he'll look at the wind conditions in Wrigley Field and, uh, you know, Texas, the ball used to fly out of that ballpark. So that was a, a popular place for a lot of, of fantasy players to stack their lineups. Uh, you know, 95 and humid, the ball would just carry like that. Now that it's an, it's an, in, it's an indoor ballpark. Uh, so I feel like a meteorologist and that's because I'm constantly looking at the weather, but um, yeah, you know, I, I <laughs> you're a curb your enthusiasm fan. So you'll get this reference. Yes. There's, there's an episode where um, Larry David is convinced that the weatherman is going on te television, completely lying about the forecast so he can get the golf course to himself. Now, that's not necessarily what we're trying to do. In fact, we're, the goal is to try and get as much right as we can. But I, I think as long as you embrace Joel when you get it wrong, too, um, there's transparency is so important in this business. Um, you mentioned the one eight one nine hundred numbers from a, a little bit ago. You know those guys aren't telling you when they screw up or when they mess up because they do. Gambling is really really hard, and if you're anywhere close to fifty percent, you know you're doing an amazing amazing job. So yeah. I get a ton wrong, and I at least like to think that okay, the process was there, and here's here's my transparent way about where my information came from, what I was looking up, what stats I was focused on. And sometimes a guy just sucks, you know, they mess up. So do we. So as long as that's transparent and understood that this is supposed to be fun, that's more importantly than anything else. This is about entertainment. Um, absolutely. I feel like a meteorologist all the time because meteorologists are really good at their jobs and they study a lot. And, you know, I, I think they're a little bit more reliable than, than, than sports betting analysts. I would say that. 
Yeah, it's not easy. And and by the way, if someone's looking to just place that one big bet, good luck. You're just rolling the dice. I mean, this is, as you said, entertainment. And so if for a lot of people, it's just something fun to do every single day. And, and you'd like to come out with more wins than losses. And, you know, if you're thinking you're going to win 80, 90 percent of the time, you're crazy. Yeah. So um, that's, you know, I know that people say, oh, let me just make this one big bet. And, I'll, and that, but first off, that could be really dangerous. I won't get into all that. But um I, there is, there's so much entertainment value to this because you see so many people playing the fantasy sports as they've been the last number of years, and now there's so many more options. So the last question is this, selfishly speaking, of course, I don't follow football the way I used to anymore. I just, you know, for me, it's like my brain doesn't turn there until October, you know, or for a couple years with the Royals, it didn't turn there till November. So we've had a fantasy football league in the family for a number of years now that started when the kids were young and now the kids know more than the adults and, you know, they're teenagers and they're in their 20s and, you know, high school, college and all that. And there was a stretch where I just said, I'm too busy to do this. I'm just going to auto draft. Oh, I, my, no. I even changed the name of my team to the auto drafters. <laughs> and I won two years in a row So with that. So I got cocky. And so what happened was I just flat out stopped paying attention. Do you know how many years in a row I've been in last place, Ben? Like, it was pure luck that the auto draft just won. The thing about the auto, and I know it's like the worst thing for your business, is that it does strip out the emotion. Yes. You know? Uh, the problem is it takes the best players based on one service, and that's it. So if that service is wrong, you're screwed. So what does this NFL season look like? I'm not asking for a hot pick. Everybody can follow you to figure that stuff out. But uh, what's a trend right now? One trend that I think you're going to start to notice is, especially with, with the coronavirus going on, is depth's going to be a huge issue for all these different teams. Because, you know, I'll give you an example. So normally a lot of times, let's say you draft – um, you know, Dalvin Cook at the Minnesota Vikings, right? Top five running back, uh, finished top three a season ago, uh, can catch the ball, uh, go in between the tackles, get you nine, 10 touchdowns. Most fantasy owners will say, okay, if Dalvin Cook gets hurt or he gets the coronavirus, uh, I'm going to have Alexander Madison, who's one of the best backups in the NFL. And that way I'm handcuffed to the position and I have my guy. Coronavirus changes all of that. Let's say Dalvin Cook gets coronavirus. There's a pretty good chance Alexander Madison might get the virus as well. And again, you're never rooting for any of this. I, I want that to be absolutely clear. Um, what I think you're going to start to see is a lot of these handcuffed positions are not necessarily going to come from the team itself. I think people are going to want to diversify a little bit more. I don't think they're necessarily going to want to have a lot of exposure just to one team in general, because if there's an outbreak on that team, that impacts so many different players within that own team. You know, it's nice to think about having a piece of the Kansas City lineup and have multiple pieces. But if something were to happen, that could really hamper your season. So I, I think more than ever, you're going to start to see a more diversified approach when it comes to picking lineups, making sure that you don't have too much exposure into one team, because in the event that somebody goes down, that's coronavirus related. And again, go down, they're sick, they're missing time. God forbid anything else were to happen. Um, but I do think that's going to be a little bit more of a different approach this year. I, I think people are going to try to find ways to have little pieces of really good offense is and just sort of spread out their lineups as best they can just because they know that this is something that's going to impact the fantasy season all throughout the entirety of the fall and the winter well i'm in last place in baseball because half my team uh started the year with the coronavirus so right, you're taking cardinals and, and marlins players i don't know if i would have advised that either <laughs> yeah no i i know so well <laughs> even before that it was you know juan soto oh he's right up. i mean it was like every guy I took but it's the world we're, we're living in at this point, and I know people want the entertainment. I hope there's a football season. It doesn't look like there's going to be one for college football. I hope there's an NFL season. I also know there are more important things in the world, but uh, as we're seeing right now in baseball and, and basketball and hockey, people are enjoying the live sports, uh, even if they can't be there, which makes what you guys are doing uh, even more intriguing, I think, because people do want to be involved. They always want to be involved in some way or another. So, no doubt. Uh, Ben, I'm, I'm proud of what you've been able to do. I know that there's a lot more ahead, and people can find you at si.com slash fantasy. What about social media? 
Yeah, uh, also si.com slash gambling. Um, we're writing content for both of those verticals over at SI. Uh, and then I'm on Twitter as well, at Benny Heist. Same thing with Instagram, although Instagram, it's mostly going to be um, pictures of my child and my dog. Um, so most of the, the fantasy and gambling stuff will, will usually be found on Twitter, uh, at Benny Heist, B-E-N-N-Y-H-E-I-S. And yeah, this was, this was so much fun, Joel. I appreciate the opportunity to hang out, talk, and join rounding the bases. And uh, this is always a lot of fun to, to catch up with you. There it is. I just popped that up there real quick. So if people want to follow, eh, that's a great easy way, too, just to, to get a little feel of what's going on without having to deal with, you know, Vinny from New Jersey or, or whatever it is. Yeah, I'm, much nice, I'm much nicer than Vinny. Yeah, and, and less intimidating too. It's, it's 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 Benny from the North Side, I believe, <laughs> is the way they might say it on on radio in Chicago. All right, Ben, hang tight for one second, and um, again, check him out at si.com slash fantasy si.com slash gambling or at Benny Heiss. I uh, hope everybody enjoyed that. A little bit different of uh, of the way that we are working in this world. Um, great to visit with Ben. And I hope that everybody has a good Monday. A huge thanks to my friends at KCAV, Kansas City Audio Visual, um, who hooked me up with all this. And then I started messing with microphones over the weekend for a couple of reasons. And so hopefully we've got all that figured out. That's on my end. But um, they have really, really made this look so nice. So if you're looking for audio visual, any size, big offices, Please check them out at KCAV.com and to my friends at Enterprise Bank and Trust. Hashtag no stopping you. Can't thank them enough for the partnership. Episode 101 is in the books. I'll see you back here tomorrow for episode 102. Thanks for watching Rounding the Bases Live, presented by Enterprise Bank and Trust.